Now, do Thanks you for your time. So I want to spend just uh, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes on what Paul Hemus is doing in the area of virtual reality. We are a motion tracking company, um, but we, we've seen the, the demand for our products in virtual reality just explode, particularly in healthcare simulation. Uh, but before I do, uh, it was interesting this past Memorial Day weekend, I was in my yard doing some, uh, doing some yard work and I was thinking about this meeting. You know, thinking about what to say in my presentation and everything we're doing at Paul Hemus and medical VR. And one of my neighbor's chickens rudely came across and interrupted my train of thought. And I got looking at this stupid chicken and still thinking about VR in this meeting. And I noticed, as you probably have, their eyes are not like ours. Our eyes are basically on a, a fixed plane looking outward. And a chicken's eyes are on roughly two parallel planes facing this way. And I thought, you know, what, what a challenge for a head-mounted display. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I got back to my office, I realized, wait a minute, someone's already doing this. <laughs> could be done. Uh, and, and if it could be done, probably the next challenge would, would be this one. <laughs> uh, Paul Hemus has been around a long time. Uh, we started in 1969, named after the founder, Bill Paul Hemus. Uh, the first application was pilot head tracking, uh, and that's something we still do today. So a sensor goes on the pilot's helmet, and this is his, uh, his head moves. Things like armaments move, it inputs to aviation, uh, avionics, and this type of thing. There's a whole bunch of these out in the field, uh, as you can imagine, and common applications are biomechanics, so putting our sensors on, on people or animals and measuring things like uh, gait analysis or uh, you know, shoulder kinematics, these types of things. Training simulators is becoming our biggest market uh, very quickly, and then neuroscience also doing things like uh, motor control research. Uh, another note on our history, uh, this year marks the 20th anniversary of Pixar, uh, the first uh, full-length feature film that was totally animated. Uh, Paul Hemus's uh, motion trackers are also, can be used as a digitizer. Here's the basically a sophisticated motion tracking sensor that's a digitizing pen, uh, and it was used to digitize most of the characters in Toy Story. Uh, we were awarded a, uh, an Academy Award for that work in 1995. Unrelated, but we're proud of it, and it's the anniversary this year. So. Uh, if you're going to be in the San Francisco International Airport, uh, you know how they have that long corridor that's a, uh, a museum uh, that they rotate every six months or so? There's going to be a, a museum dedicated to uh, the Pixar story, and there will be a, a Paul Hemus uh, uh, kiosk there. So typical applications for us, biomechanics I mentioned, we're here to talk about virtual reality. Um, somewhat related, physical therapy and rehabilitation. Um, this would be putting, putting sensors on the patient and measuring their progress or, or lack of. Uh, things like neuroscience. Uh, so here's this digitizing pen popping up again. In this case, we're not digitizing objects. We're digitizing the XYZ locations of EEG or MEG uh, sensors. And, and the reason for this is that this technology has helped us understand what areas of the brain uh, uh, work the different the different cognitive functions and if you're doing an experiment and you're doing some baseline EEG work when you go back to do subsequent experiments if you want high correlation you need those things to be in exactly the same spot that they were before also um, somewhat healthcare related motor control research so things like studying uh, cerebral palsy and Parkinson's disease so um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, measuring tremor is, is a good example. So putting our sensors on, on the patient's uh, uh, extremities and measuring tremor uh, before and after treatments. So the crux of this presentation is going to be uh, about virtual reality training simulators because that's where we're seeing the most traction in the, in the medical VR space. Uh, I'll talk about this and actually show a video of a very successful commercially available system. Uh, but I want to start here. So this this uh, welding simulator uh, was developed by the world's largest manufacturer of welding equipment. And what they found, what what's turned out to be a worldwide uh, very serious shortage, uh, uh, there's a very serious shortage worldwide of welders. It's, it's so serious it's being discussed in the halls of Congress. So one of the problems is it's very, very expensive. You have the welding equipment, you have the the uh, exhaust hoods, you have metal, you have gases, and it turns out the attrition rate of welding students is very high. So they come in within days or less than a week, they're gone, they give up. Meanwhile, you've spent all this money. So there was a real push to get the cost down and also to, to excite people about learning how to weld. 
So they developed this virtual reality welding simulator. The student pulls down the welding helmet and there's an HMD. And now they're immersed in a submarine or a car factory or whatever it is. Polhemus sensor is lodged in here. It's, it's measuring, the, tracking the head movement. And there's a Polhemus sensor in the tip of the mock torch to, to measure the position, orientation, and speed of the, the welding torch. The point I want to make on this particular simulator, it's, first of all, it's wildly successful. They can't, we can't build enough of these things. Um, this will never replace uh, a real welding uh, machine or uh, you know, to certify someone to become a welder. But what it does do is it drastically lowers the cost uh, for that high attrition uh, population. And it's, it's, they found that the attrition rate is actually less. Students, they get a little more excited, like, hmm, maybe, you know, maybe this is for me. And then they graduate on to the, to the real welding simulator. Uh, we're going to show some examples of, uh, of, of uh, medical simulators, particularly ultrasound. And uh, just another example of an industrial uh, training simulator. This happens to be uh, spray painting, very similar to the welding, welding case. So motion tracking simulators, particularly for healthcare, present some, some unique challenges. Uh, first of all, the tracking accuracy of the sensors has to be at least that of the procedure uh, being simulated, which is typically in the one to two millimeter range. Uh, it typically also has to track position and orientation, and that's unique to Polhemus motion tracking. Uh, it's the only motion tracking technology, it's magnetic, we'll get into how that works, uh, but it's the only tracking technology that measures both X, Y, and Z and azimuth pitch and roll natively. Uh, other tracking technologies measure either position or orientation, and they have to calculate the other three. Uh, and in the case of inertia sensors, they can only measure orientation, and they can't, you can't derive a position from that because you have to integrate the signal twice and you're also integrating the error signal and so it, it essentially becomes unusable. Um, ideally you don't want it to detract from what it is you're simulating. So for example in the case of an ultrasound probe you want it to look and feel like an ultrasound probe. So if you can embed the sensor, uh, make it invisible, that, that's, that's best. Uh, latency should be low, and latency is the time between when a movement happens and when it's reported to the application. Um, and if it's a fully immersive application, as, as most of you know, you, 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 can get, you can get seasick, uh, you can get motion sickness pretty quickly, and that's generally uh, recognized as being, oops, being in the uh, 20 millisecond range for latency. Independent of all of this, uh, fidelity metrics, uh, it, you know, if it's going to be used in, in hospitals and clinics, it, it needs to be reliable, of course. It needs to be repeatable. And this is one of the problems with uh, video game controllers. Um, you know, they, they do very well for, you know, tracking, a, a, you know, tennis movement and things, uh, but they're, they're not terribly accurate. But more importantly, they're not, oops, they're not very repeatable. So you can line up several video game controllers of the same manufacturer and run some tests and you'll find they can vary by as much as 10 to 20 percent. And if you're designing a medical training simulator, they all need to be the same coming off the shelf. Cost effective and easy to set up are also important. So uh, electromagnetic trackers, we've got a couple of them in the back room which we'll be demonstrating, but it's a very, very simple uh, mechanism. We have a magnetic source. Um, it creates a magnetic field. It's basically a sophisticated electromagnet. There's a coil for X, Y, and Z. And then the magnetic sensor is also concentric coils X, Y, and Z, and they're basically antennas. They pick up the magnetic field, and through some uh, signal processing and algorithms, we, we compute position and orientation. There's the source, the magnetic source, there's the sensor, and there's the tracker box. And why would you want to use electromagnetic tracking versus something else? The primary reason, at least for, for training simulators at least, is there's no line of sight required, as you have for infrared or other op optical techniques. And that's nice because you can embed them inside of things, like mannequins, like probes. Uh, they're full sixed off. They're, they're accurate. Uh, they're low latency. Uh, we can get into some of these numbers later if there's questions. Um, high update rates, it can range from 60 hertz up to 240 hertz. Uh, and there's no drift. There's no accelerometers or inertia sensors in here. It's all magnetic. And they're small and portable, and they're very easy to, to use and set up. This is a big reason why manufacturers are, are using magnetic tracking. Uh, Polybus used to have a tagline years ago, and it, it came from customer feedback, is it just works. You turn that thing on, it's a free-running system, 
and it's tracking and it's, uh, it's it, the simplicity is, is very nice. There are some limitations of electromagnetic tracking. One is the range of motion that you can detect is limited by the the size of the magnetic field, much like a radio station. You get too far away, the radio signal doesn't come in any longer, it gets noisy. So for most training simulators, that's not an issue because we're doing short-range training, uh, uh, tracking. So for example, in, in, in a orthoscopic surgery, you know, you're working in a, a very small space. Uh, we do have a, a, a somewhat newer tracker called the G4. It's our fourth generation that can track up to 30 meters. Uh, uh, this is being used for things like uh, gait analysis and sports motion analysis. The accuracy can be affected by close proximity to large metal objects. And that's because our algorithms assume this nice uniform dipole magnetic field. And now if you bring in a, a, a filing cabinet or a metal desk, that magnetic field is no longer spherical. It's something else. It's warped, or as we call it, distorted. Uh, there are some ways around this. Obviously, we um, it's, it's used quite effectively, but, but it is something you have to uh, be mindful of. Small objects like nails and screws, jewelry are not a problem. They're just not big enough to affect the magnetic field. Uh, and some metals are not a problem. Titanium is absolutely no problem at all because it doesn't conduct electricity very well. Some alloys of stainless steel are, are not a problem for the same reason. And there's a general rule of thumb that if the distance between the magnetic source and the sensor is X, you want to keep large metal objects 2X away. And that, that usually eliminates the problem. Right, so I'm going to show you a, a case study. This is from a customer of ours. It's an ultrasound training uh, simulator. There's a high fidelity mannequin and, and various ultrasound probes. Um, and what's nice about this is that you can, you can dial in just with software uh, the different pathologies. You don't have to wait around for a patient with a particular pathology and then gather everybody around for, for some training. All goes as planned. <laughs> uh, by the way, this I'm not promoting CA in any way, but they, uh, they generously allowed me to use this video and, and use their name. They're obviously using our sensors in, in what's called, whoops, the Vimedics, uh, the Vimedics training simulator. No. Oh. You hear that? Yep, I did. Advancements in ultrasound technology have changed healthcare practices in emergency rooms, operating rooms, and in physicians' offices. Many of today's practitioners are expected to be proficient with ultrasound tools oh. and skilled in image interpretation. The here offers an unparalleled training environment. Developed by physicians, the Vimedics Ultrasound Simulator engages learners, speeds uptake and retention, and enable students and practitioners to develop ultrasound skills in a risk-free environment. The Vimetic system includes a realistic mannequin, a split-screen monitor with both standard ultrasound views and 3D animated images. With more than 50 pathologies, Vimetics exposes learners to a wide spectrum of patient cases. Vimetics is the only ultrasound simulator that offers the transthoracic and transesophageal modalities and fast and focus exams on one learning platform. I'm Dr. Robert Amyat. I'm a cardiologist, echocardiographer, associate professor of medicine at the University of Montreal. I also act as director of ultrasound simulation products at CE Healthcare. The system was designed by physicians. For us, it was important to have a single platform a single mannequin and a single computer supporting all the different modules that we offer, namely the transthoracic, transesophageal, and fast scanning simulation. It was also important for us to have a realistic mannequin, a mannequin with soft skin, a depressible abdomen for the fast scanning, palpable ribs that you can feel actually when you, when you scan the mannequin with your, with your probe, and also an upper GI to support the transesophageal. We also wanted the major bony landmarks to be palpable on the mannequin, so that you really have the feeling of scanning a real human being.
15 years ago when I trained to become an echocardiographer, I found it challenging to generate the images and also interpret the ultrasound images. My solution was to use a plastic model of the heart that I would open and try to figure out how come an ultrasound beam would generate the images that I had seen on the screen. The Vimetics display emulates a real ultrasound screen with the added learning tool of a 3D animation of the body. The split screen displays a simulated live ultrasound image on the right and an anatomical representation on the left. Learners are able to view a 360 degree perspective of the organ by unlocking the image on the left and zooming out. The instructor can alter the view of the anatomy by clicking on a box to toggle the organs, skin, and bones on or off. The transducer can cut through the image at the level of the ultrasound beam. This feature speeds learning by offering a representation of how the ultrasound beam is generating the image. On the right screen, Vimetics displays a simulated yet real ultrasound view with an accurate model that depicts the anatomy, physiology, and motion of the organ. The Vimetics system also displays certain functions of a real ultrasound scanner, such as depth of field, contrast, gain, and M-mode capability. The instructor can modify the screen images for beginners, hide the 3D animation when giving certification examinations, or enlarge either screen to emphasize one display over another. The Vimetic system, here is a cardiac tamponade case. The pericardial effusion is represented in green. Both screens show a representation of the swinging heart, the dynamic collapse of the right ventricle, and the collapse of the free wall of the left atrium. Here's a different four-chamber view of the swinging heart as well. The Vimetic system features color Doppler with the typical color conventions, which is very important in the ultrasound assessment of the heart because it shows the patient's physiology. Here, for example, is a mitral valve display. For Still hear me? Great. Pretty interesting, right? Yeah. What does CAE stand for? Canadian something or what does CAE? Canadian Aerospace Enterprises. Okay, thank you. So they they're a very large multinational conglomerate. Their primary business is um, aerospace simulators, flight, flight uh, cockpit simulators. Uh, but they're now the world's largest uh, healthcare simulator company as well. All right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, another ask. So th that's kind of it for for simulators. There's also some clinical applications for our motion tracking. Um, one area that's gaining a lot of steam is in rehabilitation and physical therapy. So using the motion tracking sensors, attaching them to the to the patient, measuring their progress or lack thereof. You know, measuring things like range of motion, um, precisely and. Um, uh, and they do, in, in this particular case, is a system uh, uh, manufactured by a company called Kamiya Group, and the patient is wired up with the Bohemia sensors, and then there's a, there's a large display, and they go through, you know, basically fun games. But these games are, are designed by the clinicians to, to exercise, uh, you, you know, the, the, the particular, uh, uh, particular thing for the patient. Um, but it's, it's tracked, it's tracked accurately, so it's much more than just asking the patient you know, do they feel pain, you know, from 1 to 10? It's, it's measuring precisely things like range of motion. And, and for that reason, it's much more than we rehab games. This is actually designed by uh, physical therapists and rehabilitation clinicians um, and, and using precise motion tracking. Uh, another, another clinical application is image-guided surgery. Uh, in this particular case, they're using it for ear, nose, and throat surgery. Uh, what they're doing here, if you look down here at this diagram, here's the magnetic source. It's on a fixture just placed above the patient's forehead. And then they're tra they're the, the polyema sensor is actually back here in the handle of the device, but through you know, just a, a software offset, we can track the, the, the distal tip of the instrument. And what they're doing is they're tracking the position of the distal tip or the instrument and overlaying it onto the patient's actual CT and MRI data, guiding them to, to the correct locations. 
Uh, the, one of the things that we're demoing in the next room is a new sensor that we just developed recently. It was developed for a cardiac catheterization training simulator. Uh, the, the sensor needed to be small so it could fit inside a catheter tube. Um, it's, it's also, um, we're getting a lot of interest for finger tracking because it is so small and uh, people want to do things like study the biomechanics of, of finger movement. And, um, and also head tracking. A lot of the head tracking sensors are a little bit cumbersome and this is so lightweight you could fit it on some glasses. It's very small, uh, 1.8 millimeters diameter and it's still full sixed off and it's got some millimeter accuracy. So that's it. The demos are, are going to be in, in this room um, in back. And uh, I'll look forward to chatting with any of you. Are there any questions? Yeah, I do quick. Uh, so my name is Neil Shell. I'm the director of business development for Polybus. We're doing a demo today of our electromagnetic tracking technology. And what we have here is a, a basic tracker. This device here is a, a magnetic source, so it's creating a magnetic field. And then the sensors, as long as they are immersed in that magnetic field, we can track them precisely in X, Y, and Z and in orientation, mm -hmm. so it's full six degrees of freedom. And you can see up here we're scrolling X, Y, Z, azimuth, pitch, and roll, and we're, we're monitoring two, two sensors simultaneously. You've got one. So I have the orange one. You've got the orange one, and I've got the green one. It's incredibly quick. It's Thank you. Nice. Right, so the accuracy on this particular tracker is about one and a half millimeters and four tenths of a degree in orientation. It's sampling at 60 hertz, and uh, we make sensors of different sizes and shapes, and we also have different tracker boxes which have different degrees of accuracy. Uh, this happens to be our least accurate tracker. Um, we have some that, that are sub-millimeter and a tenth of a degree in orientation. This is just a basic uh, interface software that comes with every tracker. Most people develop their own their own interface, mm -hmm. depending on what it is they're they're doing with the tracking data. And here's a real nice example. I brought this. This is a, an example of an ultrasound training simulator probe. And you'll notice there's one of our sensors embedded in there. And so now as they're they're moving the probe on the mannequin, we're tracking the probes movement in XYZ and orientation and is changing the sonography image correspondingly. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, can you keep it up once? Also? Sure. Absolutely. It's just curiosity. Oh, you want to see the interview? Are you moving? Oh, wow. Okay. Keep the phone away from it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're pretty close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how... Yeah. Well, this is cool. Man. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. What makes sensors so hot right now? Why are they important in, in the field? So for virtual reality, you have to interact uh, with, with the, either the computer graphics or the virtual world. And to do that, you need some sort of sensing technology. So when you move your hand, the computer has to know somehow that you've moved your hand. And sensors do that. And so when you demoed, or actually when you gave the presentation today, you spoke about a lot of this technology used for medical purposes. Right. Could you tell us a little bit about why that might be more popular now or, or how that's going with the current trends? Yeah, so I think it's, it's becoming more popular only because the use of training simulators is increasing in medicine. They're way behind, for example, aviation, where in aviation you can't even step in an in a airplane cockpit without hundreds of hours of simulator training. In medicine, that's not true at all. In fact, many clinicians aren't getting any simulation training, but that is changing. These simulators are becoming more realistic, uh, the results are quantifiable, and it won't be long before nurses and doctors and other clinicians will be required to have X number of hours of training on a simulator before they touch a real patient. So it's, uh, it's growing rapidly. So do you think in the future your company will stay in this area of simulations or do you have any additional visions for where you guys are going to be taking the company in the future? So we will definitely stay in simulation and training. Uh, it's a booming, growing market, but we're in a whole bunch of markets. That's one of the things that's fun about uh, motion tracking sensors. So uh, entertainment people use it for motion capture, for animation, and special effects. 
Um, it's used um, for, for digitizing objects. We, can, we have special sensors that are digitizers. Um, it's used in biomechanics for like sports motion analysis. Golf swing analysis, believe it or not, is a big market and they use our, our sensors. So we're in a whole bunch of markets. We're most excited about this one though because of the potential. Well, we really appreciated your presentation, but before I let you go, I wanted to know, is there any additional information that you would like to share with us that you didn't get a chance to cover during your talk? Yes. We're located in beautiful Burlington, Vermont, and we would encourage everyone to come pay us a visit. We'd love to host you. Oh, that means we can come and stay at your house? Of course. Oh, perfect. I don't know. Do you guys believe him? Do you think that he's going to really let us stay at his house? That would be, be nice. nice. <laughs> I'd, I'd go there. You haven't seen my house yet, though, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.